Well, welcome everyone tonight. We're glad to have everyone here. Thanks for coming out tonight. This is going to be a great night. I think you'll really enjoy it. There'll be some great things that uh, we'll all be able to learn tonight. Now, I want to mention a couple of things about uh, this evening. Uh, of course, Rob Jacobs is with us, as well as a guest that he has, and I'll explain that in just a minute. But you remember uh, we had Ron Bar Yehoshaphat with us, who was a shaliach from Israel, which Rob Jacobs brought uh, this year, actually. It was this year. And, of course, he has gone back to be into Israel, uh, but there's another shaliach that's coming out here probably in about a month, and you'll talk about that. His name is, is Hen Mazig. And uh, we'll probably at some point connect with him, but I know we have some of our high school students here tonight as well as young adults, and there's a lot of things to be able to connect with with this, the, the Shaliach because their focus is to reach the high schools and the colleges. So it's going to be interesting that some of the things that we hear tonight and the topics that's going to be covered uh, about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict as well as how do we respond to the media. Uh, and I'm going to leave that up to our guests to discuss that. Uh, but before I do that, I want, to, uh, I want to open with a word of prayer. So, our gracious God and King, Avino Makenu, we're so thankful, Lord, that we're here tonight. Father, that you've called out a people. We could have been born someplace else. We could have been in another land at another time period. But you called us to be here now, to be uh, amongst what's happening, amongst people whom we love. And that, Lord, you direct our steps, you direct the way that we should go, and that we are a part of history in this very evening, Father, as, the, as these words resound around the world to bring words of wisdom to people that, uh, that need direction. And we thank you for that tonight and for our guests. In the name of our God, who is our salvation, amen. amen. Now, more than a guest, more than one time here, uh, Rob Jacobs has been here, and he is a regional director for Stand With Us Northwest in the Pacific Northwest. And uh, about a month ago, I believe it was a month ago, we were guests at the town hall meeting with Erwin Cutler, who was uh, uh, of the parliament out of Canada, a member of the parliament in Canada, as well as an activist. And we were certainly stimulated by a lot of the things that he had to say. In, uh, in 1895... There was a journalist by the name of Jacob Reese. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. But he wrote uh, an 18-page article in New York City about how the other half lives. I don't know if you've ever heard of that, but he was a famous journalist. And it was about the, ten the people that lived in the tenements and the, the poor people that were in the lower side of Manhattan in the late 1800s. And in this article, he described the conditions and, and what was going on, how it was going on. And there was a, someone in the legislature at that time who was also on the commission for the police department in New York City who read that article. And his name was Theodore Roosevelt. And he came to, he, he wrote a letter to Jacob Reese and he says, I've read your essay and I've come to help. And when we were at this meeting uh, about a month ago, and some of the things that were described in this meeting relative to Israel and the delegitimization de de of Israel, uh, a real chord struck my heart. Not only for all of us that are here, but for the young people that are here as well in high school of, and, and colleges of where the attack really is in the minds and the hearts of young people, but affects everyone worldwide because the destiny of many peoples resides in what happens in Israel and in the Middle East. And so it really struck a chord in my heart because I realized that with all of us here that are at El Shaddai, as well as those, of, uh, those that are around the world who are not part of a congregation, who uh, support, of course, support what we're doing here at El Shaddai and love the Jewish people and love Israel, that you would feel the same, that you would come here to help. And that's what Stand With Us Northwest is about in our connection with Israel and with the Jewish people. And so Rob Jacobs has brought with him a guest, Robert Wilkes, who's a former Navy pilot during the Vietnam War, and he has a public relations and a marketing uh, firm. And they're going to share with us some of the things that we, we can do to help Israel, to respond to the media, to respond to this generation about Israel and how to put that into words. But it'll also help to clarify our thinking about how we think about Israel and how we communicate about Israel, because... During this election and speaking to people around the country, a lot of times people will, they'll say things about what's going on in the Middle East and they don't really have the solid facts. They really can't put it into words. 
So sometimes we need people to, to take that information, digest it for us, and put it into words that we can communicate. And so with that, please welcome again, Rob Jacobs. You did great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to thank Pastor Mark and Pastor Art for inviting us to come here to speak with you today. Um, as, as Pastor Art said, I'm Rob Jacobs, and I'm the regional director for Stand With Us. And Robert Wilkes, who's going to be speaking after me, um, is the, one of the members of our local Stand With Us board and probably the most active writer on our media response group with the most experience. And so Stand With Us um, is an Israel advocacy and education organization. And we have our main offices in Los Angeles, but we have 14 other offices around the United States and Canada, and an office in Jerusalem, and now in London and Paris. Why, why do we need an organization that does Israel education and advocacy? It's for the same reason that we came here tonight, and I'll explain. You all know that ever since Israel was formed in 1948. It's been surrounded by enemies. So 1948, Israel was formed, and the very next day, it was attacked by armies surrounding it and miraculously survived, uh, and not only survived, but grew. It's fought six wars since then that are military conflicts. And today, as you probably all know, in the last two days, Israel has been the target of 200, over 200 missiles coming from Gaza. Hamas and Hezbollah and the Palestinian Authority are not just waging a violent war, military war against Israel. They're waging two kinds of wars. And the second kind of war is what we're talking about today. It's a PR war. It's a public relations war, and they're trying to make sure that Israel is delegitimized. It's a hard word to say, but what it really basically means is that people around the world stop believing that Israel has a right to exist, that Israel is some kind of rogue nation. They're trying to get people in our communities not only to believe that Israel doesn't have a right to exist, but frankly, to hate Israel, to believe, as they've said, that it's the world's worst human rights violator in history. And they're having success. They're having success because they have too many supporters, too many allies in the United States. From the anti-Israel bus ads that they tried to run in Seattle two years ago. I'm going to change slides. There we go to the boycotts of all Israeli products that they're trying to push through at food co-ops, to anti-Israel efforts to have our colleges divest uh, their endowment funds from companies doing business with Israel, to anti-Israel speakers in so many churches, on so many campuses, and yes, even at so many high schools now in our area. And they're, they're winning this PR battle. Too many young people are coming out of college having heard from their professors and from their friends and from you know, the media, from everything, that Israel is this violator of human rights. Israel is an apartheid state. It's a genocidal state that's, that's, that's you know, committing policies of ethnic cleansing against the Palestinians. This poster was put up all over the University of Washington just last year. There have even been speakers in our high schools talking to our kids saying that Israeli soldiers use Palestinian children for target practice. And that the IDF, one of the most moral military forces in the world, uses rape as a weapon. If they win this war, there won't be support for Israel in the next generation. 
If they win this war, Israel won't have an important ally in the future to stand with it when it needs it. Because if they win, people won't support the politicians who do support Israel. And Israel will be much weaker and much more vulnerable. Stand With Us was formed to fight this PR war. We respond to anti-Israel activity locally. We led the fight to stop the anti-Israel bus ads in Seattle. And we're running pro-Israel bus ads right now in Portland to counter anti-Israel ads there. Over the last four years, we've brought a number of young Israelis who are well prepared to speak on behalf of Israel to talk about the miracle that is Israel today. These are just a few of them. And then they speak at the high schools, at the colleges. They're out there presenting a firsthand perspective on who Israelis are by their own presence, giving a sense of who Israel is to people who have heard such negative things about Israel. Our last Israeli, uh, Shaliach, or emissary, was Ron Bar Yoshefat, who spoke here. Uh, many of you were able to see him. How, how many of you were able to see him when he was last? Wow, that's terrific. Um, and in the five months that he was here with us, he spoke on 17 college campuses, some numerous times, and he spoke to over 10,000 high school students in the Seattle metropolitan area down to Olympia. So why are we here tonight? We're here tonight because we need your help. We need your help because there's such an overwhelming wave of negative information that's out there about Israel, particularly nowadays in the media. And I'll give you some examples in just a moment. I know you people love Israel. And, but even as lovers of Israel, you're, most of you are not about to uproot yourself, move your families to Israel, join the IDF, and fight on the military front. Some, some, some and that's wonderful. But it's, it's really not realistic to expect all of you to come and do that, and I wouldn't tell you to go do that right now. It wouldn't be terribly effective. But you can, you can be a soldier in the PR battle. You don't need to be in Israel to be a soldier in the PR battle. In fact, this is where it's being fought. You can help us and help Israel with the pen instead of the sword. We need people to help us to counter the misinformation and the misrepresentations in our newspapers and on our television. All it takes is a few minutes on a weekly basis to be able to respond to stories that come up, to write uh, some points, to put together a letter, to send it off. The letters that come from you folks, wherever you are, whether you're here in Seattle or you're elsewhere around the country and there's media response efforts there, that makes a huge difference. And even if your letter doesn't get printed, the editors of the papers see the, fr the number of letters, and they count the number of letters on each side of the position. And they get a sense that people really are out there supporting Israel. I want to show you a few slides before I turn this over to Robert Wilkes, who's going to walk you through the nuts and bolts of newspaper media response and how to put together that letter and that make it so effective. I don't know if you can see this. It's the parliament in Gaza, or the governmental group in Gaza of Hamas, mostly. And they're showing, uh, well, first of all, how many of you knew that Israel supplies fuel to Gaza for their power plants, even while Hamas is firing missiles? Okay. So at one point, when Hamas was firing off so many missiles, a dramatic increase, Israel cut back, didn't even stop, but cut back on the amount of fuel for the power plants. 
And the PR effort that came out of Gaza was amazing. Picture after picture, like this one, showing the parliament working in the dark with candles because they had no power. But there's a real problem with that picture, and I'm not sure if you can see it with the way it's lit up right now. But if you look closely at the windows where they pulled the drapes, it's daylight outside. So why do they have candles there? It's because they needed to make a picture. They needed to make an image. This is the cover of a book by a woman named Stephanie Gutman, which I highly recommend. It's called The Other War, and it's talking about the PR war. And if you look at that picture, what you see is a young Palestinian throwing a rock in anger or in frustration or attacking an Israeli, except the problem is that what you really see is he's throwing a rock, and there are 30 or 40 photographers crouched down on the ground to get a great shot of it, and they're going to sell that picture, and just like this one. Let me show you one more. Here's a great action shot of a Palestinian with a Palestinian flag throwing something. The problem is that that picture was what was in the newspapers. This is the reality. Oh, wow. Finally, here's a picture that was seen all over the world, used in newspapers. This particular one comes, as you can see, from the New York Times. And you can see that there's a, if you look closely, that the, picture, the man in the foreground is bloodied head, looks desperate, is on the ground. Um, and the man behind is an angry, what they called an Israeli soldier in the, the um, caption. The caption says, an Israeli policeman and a Palestinian at the Temple Mount. Well, there are a couple problems with it. First of all, it's not on the Temple Mount. It's, there's a gas station right behind them. And the gas station's in Hebrew. Wouldn't be on the Temple Mount. Second is that it is a policeman. It's not a military officer. It's not a soldier. Third thing is it turned out that that actually was a young Jewish man who was visiting Israel who was in a cab that was attacked by a mob of Palestinians and was torn out of the cab, was beaten severely, and was making with his last efforts after he was gashed in his legs badly, was making his last efforts to get up to where he saw a police station. And that policeman is angry and yelling because he's yelling at the crowd to back off from this man, but the PR and the assumption in the newspapers and the way it was presented is Israel bad, Palestinians innocent. This was a story that just happened and I wanted to say how effective media response really is. This was in CNN just the other day. And the headline, as you can see, medics, Palestinians killed in Gaza shelling, it talks about how 20 or so people were at a, uh, basically a funeral or mourning the loss of somebody else when shells from Israel came in and wounded many of them. What it doesn't tell you in this picture, I mean in this story, is what really happened. And there was a massive media response that the organization Camera, which does a similar type of thing, media response, but on major newspapers nationally, Camera responded and said to everybody, please write, point out that this is false, that they're completely missing the fact that this was a response, the shelling was a response to 200 missiles being shot at Israel and an anti-tank weapon being shot at a jeep in Israel that, that injured four soldiers. And this is what happened. CNN, to give them credit, Change the story, and now you've got a picture, it's very hard to see, but you've got a picture of Israelis running for cover. A young woman holding a child, running in, uh, trying to find cover, and it starts off by talking about how the Israelis were responding to missile attacks and to the attack on this jeep. So this is what you can do by helping out. You can educate people, you can get people to know the truth by working with media response, by responding to stories. And now Robert Wilkes is going to come up, and he's fabulous. He's gonna tell you how to take those letters, how to put a letter together, how to focus it, and how to make sure it gets printed. Robert? Thank you. Thank you, I can't say enough about the warm welcome that Rob and I have had from everyone here, and how, what a pleasure. Thank you so much, and thank you for caring about the things that we care about. I think we're, you know, this is a common theme and, and we can all feel the same emotions. So, so uh, 
I, uh, I've had a good life as a writer. Uh, I didn't start out as a writer, I started out in engineering. And uh, when I got my job at Boeing uh, long ago, I, uh, I found out I wasn't such a great engineer. But I, I could write. I've always loved to write. Uh, I just love the action of writing and, and getting my thoughts down on paper and trying to be clear and trying to make sure I can communicate to others. And to me, that's a great joy. And uh, at Boeing, it, it, it was great for me. I actually became the Boeing speechwriter for the president of Boeing and the vice presidents. I wrote some of the papers they wrote to the government. I wrote magazine articles. And I had a nice, it got me out of my problem of, how, 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 of being a mediocre engineer. So I uh, eventually started my own company. And now I do branding and public relations and so on. And uh, so I'm here to tell you tonight how to be a better writer. So, you don't have to be a professional writer. You, uh, although I will speak to the younger people who are in the audience or who are listening to this, that if you do practice and you do try to be a better writer, it will move you forward. It will move you forward in every possible way, in, in your professional life, in your personal life, and it's worth the effort. And it helps you think. It helps you get your thoughts processed. It makes you read other things so you can see how the writers that you admire got to where they are. How do they do it? And, uh, and the process of that is autodidactic, and you, begin, you get smarter and smarter about things. So uh, I, I encourage it. For the older people here, you have a different responsibility, and you shouldn't fear expressing yourself. And um, I'll tell you why. I, I think our responsibility, now that I'm over the hill, is that the things that we've grown through a lifetime of experience to value, the, the moral things, the, the, the issues about life that we think are important, and about our country and our world, we have a responsibility to pass those on to future generations, which is what you do here in your, in your uh, assembly. And um, our public forum isn't the town square where we get on soapboxes, it's our media. And the, the way you can get involved in that public forum is to write. Uh, letters to the editor are the, the easiest way to do it. They do get published. I'll talk to you about that. And uh, you can even, um, after you feel good about your writing, uh, submit an op-ed, like the Seattle Times takes guest op-eds. Uh, if you can keep it to 800 words and make it interesting, you have a chance. Uh, I've done it, and you can do it too. So let's talk about writing. It's, it's my joy, my pleasure. And let's take a start with a slide. Can you, all right, I'll, and so this is my list, and I'm gonna go through these point by point. So next slide. First thing is, you should have a clear point of view. And the way the test of that is, so you, you hand your piece to somebody, have them read it, start a conversation. Five minutes later, say, what did I say? In other words, what did you take away from that? And it should be very clear what your point of view is. It should, it, and so the takeaway is really what you're trying to do. And you should understand your own point of view and make it clear to people. The next point is, is you've got to keep the argument simple. The, the long version of a letter to the editor in the Seattle Times is only 200 words. That's what, you, if you look up the stuff in the opinion section and you get the rules of letters to the editor, uh, it's 200 words. But I'm here to tell you, most of those go in the online version, the longer ones. If you have a little short, pithy, impactful 50-word statement, they probably will put it in the print version. Uh, I can't help myself. I do mostly the 200-word versions. And if you were to take my name, go to the Seattle Times opinion section, and put my name, Robert Wilkes, in, you'll get a list of last five years or so. It's just something, you know, you can see your stuff. And uh, so if you don't see it in the print section, it's online. Now, I'm old enough to really have a bias for the print section, for the paper that comes to my doorstep. But um, I'm getting over it slowly. I'm not over it yet. But people do report to me. Uh, I get emails from all over the country, and uh, things get passed around. People do read these things online. Uh, I get noticed by some of our national organizations. Um, help me out, Rob. What's the one? Uh, uh, camera. Camera sent me a, a letter saying, we loved your op-ed, and they're on the East Coast, or, or, your, or my letter. So keep it a simple argument. You have to distill it down. 
uh, you can't write a lawyer's brief. Uh, so you have to be brief and you have to pick and choose which of the many things that make your argument that you're going to actually use in your letter. You can't just ramble all over the place. I'll get back to that idea. And so one simple idea. The hardest thing about writing these is what to leave out. So I'll tell you, uh, first of all, I never have writer's block. I mean, hardly ever. Hardly ever. So uh, I just sit down and write. I don't care whether it's the first sentence. It's something in my head. I start spilling my thoughts out on the page, and I write too much. So for a 200-word uh, letter to the editor, I might write 350 words, and then back up, see what, what looks good. You know, it used to be when we had those old IBM Selectrics, and I worked, uh, when I worked in industry, and I finally got one that had that little impact thing with the white out that would take the letter back out. I thought I was in heaven. And, um, and so I would type all my thoughts and I would do all my writing and then I would put it on the table and cut the paragraphs apart and then start reordering them because you never do it in the right order. The thoughts just don't come to you in the right order. And uh, so that's fun. But now we have cut and paste and move. It's very simple. So there's going to be a, a good thread. There's the, some of the sentences are going to be in the wrong order. That's part of the editing process. But try, to, try not to ramble. Try not to say too much. I have problems um, getting that point across to my own friends in my media response group. And uh, we just had this where, uh, oh, by the way, in the media response group, when I write a letter to the editor, uh, I send it out to the active people. And, and if there's time, if it's an op-ed or whatever I'm writing, I say, critique this. And one of the things as a writer that's healthy is to lose your ego. And, and you appreciate the people that are hardest on you because you, you want their negative reaction. You really do. Um, and and if, they, if it hit them the wrong way, you want to know about it, right? And uh, so this, this good fellow who uh, you know, is very strong in his opinions, and he just packed too much stuff in one uh, letter to the editor. Uh, he actually got it published in the Jewish Transcript, which is the local Jewish newspaper. Uh, and then he wrote uh, to me and others and said, what'd you think of it? And I didn't answer. I didn't like his letter, it's okay. He, he got it published, he, he tried, and then he said, come on, it's, it's worse than hearing criticism to hear nothing at all, please tell me. And I wrote back and I said, I read your letter, I, I put it away and I couldn't remember a thing you said. You said 300 things. And uh, so keep it simple, that's my message. Does that make sense? Okay, so write with warmth and understanding. Nobody wants to hear angry people. You, you turn away from things that are unpleasant in life. And I'll give you a parallel from uh, my work in branding and uh, we do package design. And there was actually a study done by Ralston Purina where they put helmet cams on people so they could see what the, exactly where they were looking on a shelf. And they purposely designed a dog food or something that was ugly. And it was just a bad looking dog and it was bad artwork and everything. And, and if you watch it, this is visual, but there's, I think there's a parallel. And you watch people scan the shelves and they would get to this package that was really not good and their eyes would bounce away. They'd go somewhere else. They didn't want to sit on the ugly. And I don't think people want to spend their time with an angry letter, you know? And so you have to express your warmth uh, uh, to me. And you have to make a human communication with the reader so that they'll like you enough to listen to your point of view. Does that make sense? So make, get some sort of human connection. And uh, anchor convinces no one. Um, if you've ever been in a meeting, uh, the people, I went, uh, I took a master's degree in business and they, they have these fish bowls where they, they, they throw out really kind of a phony argument just to get you talking and people will argue their point of view and then the instructor will say, um, well, look, he was relaxed, he was sitting up straight, he was looking you in the eye and he was getting his point across. He was slouched over and he was yelling and nobody paid attention to him. Nobody paid attention to the word he said. So uh, you can express that in your writing by being warm and educate the reader. Now, in an age where we all have computers and we all know how to Google, and uh, you know, uh, when somebody showed me Wikipedia the first time, I thought, well, that, what nonsense. You know, I grew up with Encyclopedia Britannica. You're gonna tell me this Wikipedia thing is, but it is. It's an amazing thing. The information as a writer that I can do to check my facts, to learn the history in so little time. I don't need a trip to the library. 
It's the most fantastic thing. I'm a believer. I wasn't, but I am. And so there should be no excuse other than sheer laziness that you get your facts wrong and that you can't find some information that you can throw in your letter that is interesting and educational for the reader. And, and so there's a reward then to the reader. And you've done a little bit of research. You've, you've, you've Googled along until you've found out something fun. But above all, be brief. Now, this is the hardest thing. And uh, when I write professionally, one of the things that I love is to, is to cut out all the unneeded words and get it down to where it's muscular and it's just, it just hits home without a lot of words. Uh, that's my favorite kind of writing. This says, it's too long intentionally, and says, I'm, tro I'm troubled by your headline, quote, Israel escalates violence in Gaza, which is what Rob was talking about, right? So I just made this up. Readers of your pages who see the headline and nothing else, and I'm sure there are many, will believe that the violence was started by the Israelis, when obviously nothing could be further from the truth. Israel suffered thousands of rockets fired at innocent civilians before responding. Every nation on earth has a right to protect its citizens from attack, including Israel. So that makes sense. Yeah, okay. So cut it, out, cut it down a little bit. That was 57 words. This is shorter. Your headline, excuse me for reading. Your headline, Israel escalates violence in Gaza, is deeply misleading. It suggests Israel is responsible for the violence. Israel was responding to attacks on its citizens as every nation has a right to do, period. So I said the same thing in about half the number of words, okay? So just a little quick demonstration. So let's talk about writing a letter. The first thing uh, I want to talk about is your first paragraph. This is from the Wall Street Journal about three days ago. It's from the opinion page. And the uh, letter to the other headline is, for anchors away, Navy's ship budget must stay. Nice rhyme. And my note in red to you says, this is a ridiculous title. But that's what editors do. That's, when you send in your piece, you need to make up a title. You, you should, because you want the editor to get involved with your piece. And um, you don't know who the editor is. You don't know how many years they've been out of college. Uh, they may, might be new, but you have to make, get them interested. So your headline and your first line has to grab them or they're not going to pay any more attention to it. So my, my slide says, um, I have never had an editor use my title in 20, maybe 30 letters to the editor that I can think of. Uh, they always think they're more clever than you are, and they make up their own title. They always change it, don't ask me why. I mean, I think they do it to torment the letter writers, so. Um, so, next slide. This is uh, a letter to the editor, it has nothing to do with Israel, but uh, it's a Coast Guard captain that's writing about the quantity of ships in the Navy, and, and you'll see his theme in a second. So, um, he's responding to a, an op-ed by Mark Helprin. He says, Mark Helprin correctly, but only vaguely, touches on some faulty thinking that has infected deliberations on American sea power since the end, end of the Cold War, and then he states the title. I'm gonna show you in the next slide, please. And I wanna go through this and, and uh, reduce it, take it apart. All right, so my slide sa uh, has read where it says, but only vaguely. And I said, oh, that's intriguing. There's a hook. Uh, you ever heard the word hook in relation to an advertisement or a, a headline of an advertisement? You know, they're trying to pull you in. They created a hook. Well, I read only vaguely, and I thought, well, that, I'm curious now, okay? So the, the hook was only vaguely. The next, then he gets, touches on some faulty thinking. So next slide. And uh, so he uses the expression faulty thinking. What's that? That's a charge, that's an indictment, okay? So we've got a hook followed by an indictment. So now I'm really interested because I wanna hear his case, right? And then further than that, next slide please. Uh, false, uh, faulty thinking that has infected deliberations on American sea power. So I've got in red American sea power. And now he's clearly stated the topic of his letter. And, and that's good because now you're comfortable. You know what you're gonna be talking about. So in the first half of the first, uh, first sentence, you're getting a lot from this letter writer, okay? 
And, and uh, then he says uh, the title, which Mark Helpern's title was Americans Capsizing Naval Policy, and then he has op-ed October 29th. Okay, so that's de rigueur. You have to put in what you're referring to so that people can then, if they're on the internet, look at it, read the reference that you're talking about, or go to the old paper. Okay. Now, so what has he done? This, this Coast Guard captain has in one sentence created a hook, an indictment, clearly stated his subject, and referenced the article he's talking about in very few words. I thought that was very nicely done. So let's go to his argument. So he talks about blue suitors. Well, I was in the Navy. I know what he's talking about. He's talking about Navy guys. By the way, they're pitch black, the suits, but we call them blues, all right? Don't, I, nobody ever told me why, uh, but they are black. And uh, so this is jargon. The Navy, this Coast Guard captain has used jargon. Why, and now sometimes you can lose people with jargon. My wife's a doctor and I don't know half the things she's talking about. But here the jargon is familiar to most of us, blue suitors, and it establishes his bona fides. It establishes that he's the real deal when he uses a Navy expression. So I like that in this op-ed. Next slide. And then he has parenthetically, uh, the blue suitors are historically lousy at explaining their requirements to anybody. And I thought this, his, this lousy expression was also good. I liked it. And I'll tell you why. It's folksy. It's everyday common language. So he's warming you. He's warming, I'm warming up to this writer. I liked his folksy language. Okay? He's not stilted. He's not too cerebral. He's not over my head. And he, he wanted to talk to you in language that everybody understands. So, and then we'll go to the next slide. Okay, here we are. Uh, I'm a little bit further down, and he's about to give the argument. And so he then says, uh, the, the, the political masters and the citizenry have signed off on three fallacies. Three fallacies. So he's about to show why the common wisdom about the Navy is wrong, and he's got three cases. And I'll tell you why I like that. If you're going to give a multiple argument, it's good to tell your reader how many items you have so that you can follow it and know you're switching from one to the other. And so he has the comfort of knowing he has to endure only three. All right? So I like that three fallacies, because he's given me the comfort to know that if I get through three, I've got his argument. And I'm, I'm comfortable with reading, in this case, 350 words, because this is the Wall Street Journal, and they publish long letters to the editor, 350 words. Okay, so skipping down to his conclusion, and then we're done with this, almost done with this letter. So he goes in conclusion, and I've skipped a little stuff about his argument. He says, if you can read that, one learns about going to sea by a uh, going to sea. One learns about going to sea by going to sea, with a little kind of U-H, uh, in the middle, sort of a duh, really, but it's uh. And, uh. and so this may appear to you as humor, but it's more than humor. I think this is a demonstration of wisdom. He, he's made it, he's downplayed the, the, uh, the, the kind of the depth of what he's saying, but by doing that, he appears more wise to me. Okay, so, so I'm analyzing another letter just to kind of let you see what I see in it and why I liked it. And then finally, next slide, uh, then we find out that Raymond J. Brown is a captain in the U.S. Coast Guard retired, um, and he's engaging in the public forum, doing his public duty. He's got experience in sea services, and he's staying engaged, and I encourage all of you to stay engaged the rest of your lives. Uh, it's, it's, a, it, it's a citizenry, it, being a citizen of the United States, and um, as the pastor said, we're so lucky to be born in a country like this. It could have been much worse, believe me. Uh, uh, I've been in a lot of other places. That um, if you love it, then you should protect it and you should want to see it carried forward to other gener generations. And I think that's, this is our public forum. This is our, our, the media. And I will say something else about the media. Uh, I don't have the highest respect for the field of journalism. I, 
okay, I think they went into journalism because they wanted to change the world and they knew there wasn't a lot of money in it and, uh, and they're using their positions in journalism to, in, to influence. And uh, I don't think they're necessarily the, I mean, there are exceptions at the top, you know, and then in, at the top of the great news organizations, but by and large, a lot of these people are not the, I don't, I don't let me say it, I don't think they're the sharpest knives in the drawer. And you're gonna see a lot of junk in, in this stuff and a lot of misinterpretations and a lot of obviously they're trying to uh, weave this in a way, in a message they want and they do it through the headline and through the photo. It's so easy. It's so easy for them to do it. And then if, and it, I mean, if you scan a newspaper, you're gonna look at the photo, read the photo caption and read the headline and then you're mostly moving on unless it engages you in some way. Look at the damage they can do with just that power. Now, I have a lot of respect for some journalists, but by and large, I have more respect for accountants, okay? <laughs> so uh, that's just a, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not trying to insult anybody that may be here or listening who's in journalism, but um, that's just an overall feeling of mine. So, so my point about the captain is if you have credentials, then by, by all means, state them. But if you don't, don't feel bad, you're a citizen and that gives you credentials, so step up and do your part. So we're gonna go now to an actual op, uh, letter to the editor that I responded to an op-ed in the Seattle Times. This is interesting, this op-ed was sent by an Egyptian American about the uh, Benghazi attack, the riots, the, the video, and his opinion uh, that uh, Americans should uh, modify their free speech rights to be more responsible. I'm getting into that in a minute. Uh, I didn't necessarily agree with him. And so um, it was presented by the Seattle Times under this headline, uh, why the anti-Islam film invoked such a storm. Now, the Egyptian fellow, his name is Badr, Allah Badr, didn't write that. You, you understand, this is what the Seattle Times wrote. And then they introduced him with this paragraph. Muslims should continue to use peaceful, proper, democratic means, I like that, okay, to address concerns, and Americans should learn what is deeply hurtful to Muslims, writes guest columnist Allah Butter. Okay, so then I don't have the whole thing, but I've got some things that, uh, next slide, please. Now, I don't want to appear uh, anti-immigrant or anti-Muslim, um, but um, there are some things in here that truly bothered me and propelled me to get behind my computer and respond to this. So um, I'm gonna read you the, you see in the slide there that the, I've highlighted some things in red. So in the second paragraph, he says, a trap was set by a shady figure. And further in that paragraph, he says, groups of people in six countries fell into the quicksand of rioting. Okay, so what he's talking about is, on September 11th, there were riots all over the world and, the ben and in Benghazi, our embassy was attacked. A trap was set, set by a shady fig figure is a very curious statement to me. And the fact that he used a trap is kind of conspiratorial and also, um, I don't get it. I mean, uh, I'm, I'm very puzzled by this trap. How can people be trapped? All right, okay. And that they helplessly fell into quicksand means that they, they were not responsible. They went rioting in the streets. Don't they know that it, wasn't, it was out of their control? They fell into quicksand? Okay, so I didn't like that. And, um, and then further down in this slide, it talks about the Despicable Movie, which I, had, I, I watched two minutes of it, and I couldn't take it anymore, by the way. It was on YouTube. But we all know that the attack on Benghazi, that the video had nothing to do with it. But um, that's not the point of my bringing this up. It gets different. It gets worse. So next slide. Uh, in red, it says, prior dictatorial regimes which did not permit free speech have, have recently fallen, leaving a boiling cauldron of emotions that explode with little provocation. So my note is, well, and, and by the way, this looks like my copy of the newspaper because I highlight things. And, and I highlight along the way and then eventually I write my letter. 
And I says, oh, he's shifting the blame. And then it says an American citizen who loves and understands the Constitution. Um, I believe it's free speech and he goes on. And so now my, my antenna are really up now because um, as you'll see, I think he's co-opting our liberal values. Liberal not meaning Republican, Democrat, but liberal meaning in the, in the broader sense that we have lots of freedom and, uh, and rights, okay? So he's co-opting the freedom and the rights that we have um, to change us. And you'll see that in a second. And so at the bottom, uh, it says, can we phone a bomb scare as a prank on an airliner? Can we walk into a crowded movie theater and yell fire? No, no, no. The US Supreme Court ruled in 1919 to add some logic, logical controls for just that reason. Well, I tried to find that. And so I uh, read US Supreme Court cases that were decided in 1919. And in World War I, uh, in the Wilson administration, they passed laws against treasonous speech. And the US Supreme Court upheld that in 1919 and then overturned it in 1962. And that's the only thing I can find. So if there are lawyers in the house, who know better than me, please tell me, but that's what I was able to find. So I think he's kind of technically correct, but in, if you really take it on balance, this has nothing to do with uh, free speech, okay? This, and we've gone well beyond that. So next slide, please. He then says, I'm gonna just move this along and go down to the bottom of the third. I highlighted Islam is now part and parcel of the fabric of American society. Now, I have nothing against people who want to be Islamic and Muslim and who want to follow that faith, and if it serves their life and makes them happy, I don't have any problem with that, but that's not the country I grew up in. Um, and I don't I want to sound chauvinistic in this atmosphere, but my impression of the United States is that we were founded on Judeo-Christian culture, traditions, and values. And, and for an immigrant to come here and try to change my country is not, doesn't make me happy, all right? So you, uh, and, and you know, he has the right to try to change that through peaceful means, but I'm gonna oppose it. So that's why I brought this up. Just, I thought you'd find this kind of interesting because it got me going, okay? So let's move on a little bit further here. And next slide, please. And in, the, uh, in this paragraph, he says, Freedom of speech is a blessing that we must use responsibly. And my thought, which is up there, I'm sorry, is our right to freedom of speech is widely interpreted in law. And if being irresponsible was the criteria for speech, half of television would be outlawed. Okay, so I didn't agree with him. And um, next slide, please. So I'm going to read to you, and I, you know, maybe this isn't the best thing in the world to do, but we're talking about writing, so maybe I can get away with it. I'm going to read my letter, or most of my letter, okay? So um, the Seattle Times created this title, Violence and Protests in the Middle East, The Pen, Not the Bomb, okay? I didn't write that. And my first sentence is, we should all welcome Allah Badr and his moderate views. And then I state his, uh, his article, Provocation, Understanding, Opinion, September 19th. We should all welcome him to the public forum. So I'm trying to be open, and I mean it, you know? I mean, we welcome him to the public forum. We want to discuss his issue, and he has a right to write and be in the paper. And I acknowledge that. So I'm trying to appear reasonable, even though I'm kind of angry. And I'm trying to appear uh, welcoming to other ideas, okay? So I said, we welcome him to the public forum. And then I said, he protests with a pen and not a firebomb. And so that may sound a little angry, but if you read the paper every day, uh, it's hard to argue that uh, he's in the minority. In other words, the, you know, he's a moderate, and we like that. So then... Uh, in my next paragraph, it says, Badr writes that he wants, quote, a better dialogue about what Islam is and is not. So he wants to teach us about Islam. And then my next sentence says, what Islam is, is a question for the faithful. The issue for the rest of mankind is what Islam does. And, 
And I say one need, one need only to read this newspaper any day of the week to know the answer. So I'm basically saying you, you got a violence problem, okay? And then I say, condemn the violence, Mr. Botter, in no uncertain terms, and encourage your co-religionists to do the same. So I'm taking a very clear uh, stance here and a clear point of view, okay? So that's what, and then it goes on. Uh, next slide, please. And, and here's where, okay, you tell me what you think. I, I love your opinion. My next paragraph says, please don't tell us about your exquisite sensitivities and how they must be respected. In America, we have big shoulders and we can deal with offensive speech. By equating yelling fire in a crowded movie house to insulting Muslims, you're admitting that violence is ever present in Islam. Do you agree? So, um, look, these are, these are fine distinctions. And part of the uh, fun of, of doing this was to get into his letter and find these distinctions, and it helps me better to understand where his head is and why I'm not happy about it, you see. So it was quite an exercise. So the last sentence refers to this 1919 um, Supreme Court, and I'll finish with this. It says, Botter refers to, and the, I found the opinion, it was Schenck versus the United States 1919 Supreme Court decision affirming a law prohibiting speech against the draft. That's what it was about. And uh, it was passed in World War I, and it was overturned in, not 1962, as I said, but 1966, as my notes say. And then I say, more apropos, I call to your attention National Socialist Party versus Village of Skokie, 1977. And I was sentient in 1977, and I remember this case, but barely sentient. Uh, this is where the American Nazi party marched in, in a town in Illinois that had a huge number of survivors of the Holocaust. So they were trying to be as obnoxious as they could. And the Supreme Court upheld their right to protest, even in this town, about these things with Nazi flags. So we have a very wide interpretation of the freedom of speech. And um, so I responded to his reference with mine. So I, that was just to give you an example of what propels me to write. So my final point, and then we'll take questions, right Rob, is um, about writing. And I think I'll spend a minute on our committee or our, our media response team. But here's, here's how you write good letters. Don't send it. Don't put it on an email, which is opinion at seattletimes.com and everything. Don't send it. Let it simmer. Let it rest. Time is wonderful because your brain has gone through this, these words 12, 14 times and you can no longer see anything. It sounds good, but you can't see it. You can't see the mistakes. Believe me. And so the more time, the better. But if it's, if it's timely and you want to get it in, well, give it three hours. Because in that time, when you open it up again and read it, you may be surprised, but you, you may not even think that you wrote it. And you say, who wrote that? I didn't write that. But that's what you want. You want to get another look at it. You want a little time, season it. Um, and I can tell you from being a creative in a creative agency, that, and when I work with other creatives, that your first idea that pops out of your head is the easiest and the most obvious, but not the best. In time, your creativity, given, given time for the things to ping around in your head and connect the synapses with all the other parts of your brain, then your really good creative ideas come out. But you have to start the process. You have to get the obvious stuff out. Get it on paper, get it, get it out and then the good stuff will start to come and you'll be better and better at it. So that's the last thing. So just a note on how we're, we operate as a media response team, Rob, and then I'll have you up, okay? Uh, we, um, we occasionally have social meetings where we get to see each other, but mostly we're an email group and we have a, a Google Groups set up so that whenever anybody sends anything, we all get it. Then we assign days, my day is Sunday. And, um, uh, and I am, uh, I'm, I'm looking at the Seattle Times mainly, but other things I may read uh, that are interesting, I send out. And I get the Wall Street Journal and I get other things. So on Sunday, 
Uh, I read uh, everything about the international news and I look for things about Israel. And uh, I look and I see if, if there's bias, if there's slanting uh, reporting. And if I see something, I send out potential alert. Or if it's really bad, I just send out alert. Letter writers, we need to respond to this. And they do the same thing on their days. But anybody can send out alert on any day. And, and we, uh, it's not rigid that you have to do it on your day. So we have a team. Uh, everybody's assigned a day. Uh, but there's a wider group of people that will pitch in with letters. And we have done some amazing things with letters. Rob mentioned the bus campaign where um, CMAQ, which is kind of our opposite, very pro-Palestinian, uh, paid for and bought these ads on the sides of our transit system, our buses. And I think uh, the city council reported they had 6,000 letters. Yeah, to the general community. 6,000 letters, and the city councilmen got letters, and we energized the population, not just Jewish, but everybody that was, uh, that, that wanted to support Israel. And, and you saw the ad, he had it on his slide. It was pretty hateful, accusing uh, Israel of war crimes and all that. And uh, we won that. The uh, Metro people uh, reviewed their decision, and they decided not to run the ads. So uh, uh, it's the power of what we can do. But um, so, uh, Rob, do you want to talk about in uh, you kind of creating a, come on up. So we were thinking about, okay, we have an operation in progress. It works. Uh, we can get a big response if it's an important thing. And we want to encourage you to kind of start a parallel operation. And we will coordinate oh. as, as it works. So. But the act of ri letter writing just takes starting to do it. You, know, you get better and better as you do it, and people, especially if you work with other people in a group like ours, people will critique it, as Robert said, and when somebody thinks your letter wasn't terribly effective, they'll tell you. And so you learn from that process. The, the most important thing right now is we're trying to expand beyond the group that we have right now. Uh, we've focused uh, for years, for the last four or five years, on the Seattle Times and when the Seattle PI existed, the Seattle PI. But the reality is that in the Pacific Northwest, there are about 30 papers that have a circulation of over 40,000. And with the wonders of technology now, you can make a, set up a Google alert that says if on their website the word Israel or the word Palestine comes up, send me an alert. And so we get to see what's happening in all the major papers within the Pacific Northwest. And many of them are using exactly the same story from the Associated Press or for some one of the other news services. And what we're looking for are people who are interested in writing letters. They are short letters. We will be putting together, the group puts together speaking points or writing points. And especially if we get a, a number of folks from here who are interested, we'll make sure that we always put the speaking points and writing points. You don't need to be an expert on the Middle East to respond to something that you feel is wrong. But what we'd love to do is if you write a letter responding to something that seemed terrible to you and you want to have your say, if it's in six different newspapers, we'll give you the links to send it to. You send the same letter to six different newspapers we get so much more coverage. We get so much more educational value out there to people who are reading those papers, especially in smaller towns where people do spend more time reading the letters to the editor and things like that. It's probably even more effective. But we need the additional help. We need people who are interested in trying it out. And if you are interested, I think um, the last slide has our email address to send to us or telephone number in Seattle. And even if you're not in the Seattle area, even if you're any place else in the country, email us and if we have a Stand With Us regional office nearby, we'll put you in touch directly with them. But what you can do is really be on the ground, involved in defending Israel, involved in promoting Israel, and that's powerful. So thank you so much. Questions? Is it better to um, write a, um, a letter or an email? 
Well, it, it's the same nowadays. They, the email is probably the easiest way. Uh, if you don't, if somebody doesn't have email, writing a letter, obviously, but the, they treat them exactly the same. Okay. They're they're all transmitted by email, but I make it clear in my subject line that it's a letter to the editor, and then you can just write an email. The uh, core group that is doing this. What's the number of people and? Um, are they all Jewish people, or are they just people in the community with? They're not all Jewish. Okay. Um, we have uh, a few Christians involved, mostly Jewish, right now. We'd love to have broaden it. So I think we have probably about 10 people that are very actively involved right now, and that works for one paper. You know, if you're talking about the Seattle Times, but honestly, if we want the editors of the Seattle Times to get a sense of where the public opinion is. If, we, if, if everybody in the group wrote a letter, that's 10 letters that come in. If we had people from here or even a larger group of people involved, you know, if we got 50 letters coming in, that would really make the, letter, the editors you know, pay attention and they would really get a, a, a different perspective. So it would be a huge help to get more people in. It's just off the subject, but let me mention one more thing about if you get involved and you form a group and you do media response, uh, or however, if you, it, you know, as a community, if you write letters, we have a uh, member of our group, a woman that uh, has a wall of fame on a website, and she keeps all your letters. Uh, and so, so when you uh, publish a letter, you, you kind of get this reward. You're, uh, her name is Nevit, and she's Israeli. And you get on Nevitt's uh, wall of fame, and it's a great inspiration to keep uh, doing it. So if you, have, if you do have a place for that, that's a good suggestion for you. It, it really, people love it. Okay, anyone else? Okay, I have some questions. Sure. <laughs> I'm gonna stop, I want you to just stay right here. First of all, I wanna say this, because um, you made some great, you both made some great statements. Uh, but you made a statement that if you love this country, you'll protect it, right? Mm -hmm. You believe that? Okay. I mean, you feel that way? I hope you do. Okay. Those of you that didn't clap, we'll see you after. <laughs> uh, yeah. But you had mentioned the Google Alerts, Rob. That would be mm -hmm. something that would come to stand with us Northwest. And then if we were part of this, we or yeah, you would anybody can set up a Google Alerts. Would, 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 would it be something we would sign up with? Yeah, if you send an email to us, initially at least, until people are interested, if they are, it's splitting off and doing it separately. But we'd be happy to accommodate people here, and we have the Google Alerts. We would send them out, and if some people want to volunteer to be taking a day of the week, they receive all of the alerts. So you get a, a number of uh, announcements of an article, especially when it's run in multiple papers. You'll see each of the papers. Okay. Let me say this, that, um, and I know I'm speaking to more that, that are just in this sanctuary tonight. This is not over your head. This is not over your head. This is communication 101. I agree. Okay. Yeah. And uh, in, in protecting our country, we're also protecting uh, the, the, the conceptual imagery of Israel itself and what we, the root of what we believe. This is really what El Shaddai is about and what we believe is our roots, our Hebrew roots and, and, and relative to Israel. I mean, that's a big part of what we do. We just don't teach Torah and the Bible. We, we connect that with what we do and that's why we go to Israel. Uh, and anything that I can hear, that's why your credentials are amazing. Because being in branding and in marketing, uh, this is an individual that, that uh, studies what people look at and how to communicate a concept to, to motivate people to do something, to do something different. Now, uh, how many people of you here like to write? Okay, some of you do, you know, and, I, and I, quite frankly, I didn't expect as many hands as I just, as I just saw. but. Uh, and really, I'm kind of focusing, we don't have as many young people in here tonight, but I will speak to those of you that are in high school, those of you that are in college, or that are young adults that are working, uh, the, you know, as well as the rest of you that may be retired, or you, you know, you're, you, uh, you're involved in different groups. This is something how you can really make changes. You can really make something happen. And it's because, I'll tell you this right now, on Saturday we were at, uh, of course we were at Shabbat and we have guests here every Shabbat and we mm -hmm. recognize the guests that are here. We had somebody from Mississippi. 
And I said, oh boy, somebody from Mississippi, right in the heart of the Bible Belt. But guess what? You guys are in the Torah Belt <laughs> here in the Pacific Northwest. Yeah, no kidding. But there will come a time when it gets fiery that it's going to trickle down to this level. But if we can get people involved, yeah. uh, you know, maybe five people that would be interested in responding as a, right. as a quick response group to. We, we saw what happened with the, the bus ads. Because, of course, Kufi yeah. got involved with that. Yes. I mean, they, the politicians get scared uh, when, you know, when all of a sudden there's 6,000 emails showing up in their inbox. And uh, quite frankly, we need our own weaponry, our own weaponry of words, very discreetly, yes. to communicate where our heart is. Because when it gets darkest, the light, those of us that are lights, shine the brightest. Do you agree with that? Absolutely. So if, you, if there's not a lot that you, uh, and, and you know, we have some individuals here that are politically motivated and involved in groups. Uh, of course, Jeff is involved with his blog, and, which can get pretty fiery sometimes, but, but it's a voice that's heard uh, around the world. Uh, people respond to that. Uh, but we can do that with our own keyboards and with our own pens and from and, and our own understanding. And that's why I think this information was, was great tonight. Show your appreciation for these gentlemen. Thank you. Now, how Thank can you. they, how? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. How can they, uh, how can they, if they want to become involved besides what you put up there, is there any other information that you can give them or meet with them up here or in the back or answer? We can spend as much time as people want today to talk to people about okay. what's involved or how they can get involved. Um, letter writing is one of the things that people can do. But we also, for example, when our new shaliach comes, one of the things that's really important to us is to get them out to various schools and to get them out to public and, you know, organizations. And if people here have connections, have children or grandchildren in a local school, and they can talk to the teacher there and say that there's a speaker that could come, it helps us to market our shalia, which is, a, you know, a, actually a fairly difficult thing because people don't know who they are and they've got to decide to invite them into a classroom. If there's somebody who has a connection to that teacher who says, could you bring this person, it makes it a lot easier. Um, and there, there are plenty of other things we can do. So yes, how, we'd love how many, to touch. How many here have kids in high school? Okay, how about, how about grandkids that are gonna be in high school one day? Okay, <laughs> and, and we know that, we know what's happening in these high schools. I mean, we know, you, we showed that, uh, the, the video the, from the one video, of the high the, schools. But, well, oh, yeah. Ron Barr, but also the, the map of the high schools that are being penetrated by, uh, by Islam, to, which is pro-Islam and anti-Israel. Or, or just anti-Israel speakers. And I know that I've spent some time with, uh, at times with some of the teens that are, in, that are part of El Shaddai, and they talk about, you know, there, there are Muslims that are in their, their classrooms and so on. And is, we need to have a strong voice. We need to have a strong voice for God, for Torah, and for Israel. You have a question? So if the Shaliak would come to a school, what mm -hmm. would they present? What they do is they talk first about themselves. Usually what happens is a teacher, often in the social studies, civics area, world civilization, will invite them to come, and they talk first about who they are that you know, their normal life, their, what it's like to grow up for them in Israel. So it creates uh, a, an opportunity for people there to see what the life of somebody growing up in Israel is, is like. It changes them from what often students and kids have heard, which is just what you see in the news, to a human being that actually has the same interests, so many common things. They talk about the music groups they like. They talk about that one of the best questions uh, Ron got this past year when he was here is after he goes through his whole talk, which is about himself, and then also about the conflict and about what his involvement and the IDF was like, um, the first question that came up was, uh, what's dating like in Israel? And that, you may laugh at it, but it's a serious, positive question because what it means is the person is then connecting to Ron as a person rather than as this image. Um, they're talking about something that, that buffers 
that person who's asking that question, when they go to college or they go out in the world and they hear something negative about Israel, the first thing they think is, I met this Israeli and he's a really kind of cool guy and he was really nice and I can't possibly imagine that the things you're saying about the Israeli soldiers are true given what I know. So would they travel to anywhere in Washington State? Well, Khan went all the way down to Davis, California. Okay. We'll go, he'll go wherever there is an opportunity or the next shliach will go wherever there's an opportunity to speak. That's their role and they're, they're you know, we had people try to take Ron up to take him skiing or to the mountains or something like that. And he kept saying, no, you know, I'm here to work. And he passed up opportunities to get a better sense of Seattle because what he was really doing was trying to speak as often as he could. So he'll go anywhere. Are there any other questions? Jeff, did you have? I, just was, um, I was wondering, with, with getting into the high schools and into the colleges, how easy is that? It depends. In many of the high schools, it's, it's once you connect to the teacher, if the timing is right, if they're about to cover the Middle East, or if they're saying in three, three months I'm going to be covering that subject area, they're often very willing to have a speaker come in. Um, with college campuses, it depends on the college campus. There is no way, unfortunately, that we could have created an opportunity, a serious opportunity, on Evergreen State College to have Ron go speak. Um, they, the intolerance there is amazing. But what happens in most of the schools is there's somebody that will sponsor, either it's a Jewish organization, a pro-Israel organization, that will sponsor and publicize the talk. And he's spoken 17 different campuses. Um, uh, this past year, um, some of them very difficult. Uh, Davis, California, there's a videotape for those who may have seen it, a YouTube video of Ron trying to speak at Davis and it was horrific. Um, and so they need to have, you know, a, a strong stomach and really a stiff backbone to be able to stand up to the kind of stuff that they sometimes hear. In answer to your question, I can add that Rob's office and Rob himself spends a lot of time telephoning teachers, emailing teachers, and it's a lot of hard work to get them to uh, accept our, our speaker. But they do... It you have takes... to get in real contact. We sent emails, we send letters. That doesn't have that much effect, but the actual phone call and the conversation does. And it means a lot of time, but it's, it's worth it. It's valuable. They talk to 60, 90, 120 students in a day. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. I don't know if we get some interested people here. I'm just curious, um, do you go to Christian schools? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So you Absolutely. Could, where they could learn um, how to stand their ground when they get to college? Absolutely. Against yes. the professors that speak against um, Israel? Yes. We, they, uh, Ron spoke at a number of churches, a number of, uh, he spoke to two smaller Christian schools. Um, he spoke in Tacoma. What is the high school here? Come back. Yes, exactly, Tacoma Baptist. And um, the previous Shaliach spoke at uh, uh, Cedar Park. So, uh, yes, short answer. Okay, we're just going to have two more questions. Not really a question, but a comment. Grandmother taught me that freedom of speech does not include knuckle sandwiches unless you're willing to put pen and ink to paper. Uh -huh. The other comment she made is the printed word can't change its costume. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay, one more question. I was just, uh, <clears throat> I guess it's more a comment too. Um, thinking about the black churches in the area, um, they're very politically grounded in Tacoma and Bremerton. They're very politically active. I was wondering um, about like a bridge to them. Um, I'm active at an apostolic church in Bremerton. Um, and so I know the history of these folks, and they're, I'm sure this sort of thing would resonate with them given their civil rights experiences. We would love to talk to people anywhere. Yeah. If well, you have connections and can help connect us, same email, the northwest at standwithus.com, and 
and we would love to follow up on that. And we can also be a clearinghouse for some of those things as well Perfect. to, to, to communicate that. How many of you here have, and I'm going to close this out, and what we want to do tonight as well is we'd like to take, we don't do this often, but we'd like to take an offering for Stand With Us Northwest tonight. Thank you. Uh, so uh, those of you that have a heart to give tonight, we would like to do that uh, because we really believe in what you're doing. And, and, you know, I want to say this is that how many here have had... Um, you have somebody, a friend or, or an associate or whatever, come up to you and say, you know, I really love you. How many of you have ever had that? Okay, we, you guys aren't very loved then. I love you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's try that again. How many of you had somebody come up to, hey, I really like you. I love you. You're, okay, well, there's a couple of you. The rest of you better come back here afterwards and <laughs> love you up a little bit. You know, but sometimes I look at people and they, people say things to me. That they'll say, oh, you know, I really love you. And then I'll look at them and I'll say, really, why? And then they pause for a minute. And I'm wondering, what, did he really mean that? Or would you really, you know? And I find that when I talk to people about Israel, you know, and they, they say that they support. And I found this because we've had now, we've been traveling and we, we've talked with people in Washington, D.C. And they say, well, we really support Israel. We love Israel. And then I'll ask them the question, well, why? Well, why? And they're not really sure why they support Israel. Uh, and that's, that's where we come into play here by being able to communicate why and if you don't know why writing helps you to clarify your thoughts yes. so the more influence we can have upon this nation upon this state i would prefer not to see the judgment of god come upon us because of our attitude towards israel do you agree with that okay yeah. All right, well, we know the judgment won't come upon you, so you're okay, okay. So I'm going to have a word of prayer. Father, we raise a blessing to you. Thank you, God, for the hearts of the people here. Father, if there's a, just a few that, will, that are willing to give, just to bless, stand with us, Northwest, Rob Jacobs and Robert Wilkes, uh, for their time to come down here and the impact that it'll have on maybe just a handful of people that are here. But, Father, that a handful can change a, a whole generation. Even, especially if it's the young people that are in high school or, or, or in college or a grandmother who's at home that's wondering what, what can she do today uh, or what can she share with her grandchild today that's in school. Well, Father, thank you that, uh, that these people are blessed, that you'll bless them a hundredfold for their giving and for their love and that we can truly take that, that step to one more step uh, into honoring and loving Israel. We thank you for that. Amen. So uh, you're, uh, as soon as we, we go down the aisles here, you are uh, dismissed. And if you'd like to come up and chat with uh, Robert Wilkes or Robert Jacobs about how to get forward with this letter writing, feel free to do that. Okay? God bless you. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you for studying with us today. If you have any questions regarding the material discussed, please contact me at my email address. It's Pastor Mark at El Shaddai Ministries dot U.S. Be blessed and shalom.